as we continue in our worship. Brad, come and lead us. Good morning. Good morning. You may have noticed uh, in the bulletin that Brother Darrell has selected uh, for the text for his message today, Matthew 5, verse 8, which says, uh, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. There's a hymn that comes directly from that verse, but it's not in either of the books we use here, and it's not in the Baptist hymn the leader. But it is in the Methodist hymnal. <laughs> so if you brought your Methodist hymnal with you this morning, turn to number 276. But just in case you don't have a Methodist hymnal or didn't bring it this morning, Brother Darrell put the words on uh, the insert in the bulletin, so find that. Bless are the pure in heart. Bless are the pure in heart. to give back monetarily so that the ministries that you want us to do as a church that you want us to be engaged in can happen. We specifically especially pray for our North American missionaries, the giving that we can give through Southern Baptist causes, through the Annie Armstrong uh, Easter offering. Pray for those missionaries. Pray for our giving. And we thank you that out of your abundance, you give to us. And may we cheerfully give out of the abundance that we receive from you, that others may be touched in the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, take the celebration hymnal. And turn to number 563. Open my eyes and I may see. 563. <coughs>
got somebody this morning that can actually sing. <laughs> Cheryl Wall. This morning I'm listening, Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
I think you were right in what you said about the Cheryl will sing. That part you were right about. Thank you, Cheryl, for joining uh, us for that. Certainly do appreciate that. Just looking at one verse this morning, Matthew 5, 8. Uh, how? Oh, this is, I'm not wanting to know an answer. Brenda, I, when I look at you, I don't want to see this in your face. So that's why I'm moving it. <laughs> All right, that's good. All right. I'm going to ask you a question of you, and uh, I don't really expect an answer. I, it's not that I don't want you to answer. It's that I think we need to think about it before we answer. And, uh, well, let's just get to it. How do we go right in a culture gone wrong? How do we go right in a culture gone wrong? And the question isn't about politics. It's about the culture that we live in. It's about the way we live our lives, choosing to live by the standards God has set forth in His Word. I, I don't want to get into what our leaders in Washington, D.C. have done this, this past week to take, in my opinion, our culture to new lows and to turn away from the God of the Bible. But I don't expect those who do not listen to the God of the Bible or even don't know the God of the Bible to act like they do or to present things within our culture that go along with the scriptures. So it's not a surprise. But I'm not going into politics about it today. Mitchell, I won't go there. Because it's really not about that. You know, and it, it is. Ask yourself, how do we right or go right in a culture gone wrong? Well, the answer really is this for us: one person at a time, one life at a time, one heart at a time. We can change the culture one person at a time. This is especially true for your children and grandchildren, folks. Because they are the ones hearing a lot of different things. They are the ones who are on social media. You know, it's interesting. I get on, you know, get on Facebook and think it's a marvelous, wonderful thing. Because I really can connect with people um, that I don't know their phone numbers. I don't know where they live exactly. I can't write them a letter. But you know what? I can send a happy birthday to you post. You know, it's great. But not long after I get on Facebook, you know, my youngest says, Abby says kind of, well, you know, I don't get on Facebook anymore. Oh, you don't? No. You know, so she gets on Twitter and, well, I don't know what else. Nancy, that's it. Thank you, Nancy. Nancy is, goes on stuff all the time. So, yeah. But she's like, I'm on Instagram. You know, Facebook, that's, yeah, that's passe. That's, you know, yesterday's platform. So now we're, and then now it's TikTok. And so there are a lot of things that, they, that our young people go on and, and they are reflecting the culture in which they live in and they are, and I'm not saying those things are bad, okay? What I'm saying is that our younger generation, when we do surveys about them and about religion and about their beliefs, we're finding that more and more they are saying no to church and the reason they give for saying no to church is they say, all we see in church is hypocrisy. Because the people say that they're to live one way when they're in church, but they live another way when we see them out in the world. So why would I want to be a part of that? That does, however, I would want to say this, they are spiritual. They want to know about spiritual things. They might even be able to direct them, and you might be able to direct them into the Word of God. They don't have a problem about reading the Word of God. They have a problem with churches and the people in it. And when they say, I just don't want to be with those hypocrites, be nice, put a smile on your face and say, why don't you just go ahead and come join us? There's always room for one more. I mean, you know, 
Because in some ways we're all hypocrites. We don't, we don't always live the way we are supposed to live or what we preach. We don't. Because we live in a fallen world and we have an old nature that we continue to battle against. The thing is, folks, we need to teach a Jesus that the people, that the young people can understand. That means we need to teach a biblical Jesus. Not a made up Jesus. And they'll say, well, whoa, 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 what? You know, you want to know about Jesus? Go read the Gospels. You want to know what he preached? Read the Gospels. You want to know who he is? Read the Gospels. I may not always be a good representative of Jesus Christ. I may not know exactly all that he is, but if you want to get to know him, you tell your children and grandchildren. You read the scriptures and then talk. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. If you want to send him, send him to a particular one, Mark's the shortest one. John has a lot of what Jesus had to say. I mean, they're all good. But they need to see it. They need to investigate for themselves about Jesus. Because as much as we want to be like Jesus, we don't make it all the time. We fail. But that doesn't mean we aren't called to live like Jesus wants us to live. And in this sixth beatitude, that is really a call for us to live. It has to do with the purity of heart and with seeing God. Maybe someday in the near future, uh, I'll do a sermon series on the beatitudes or even the Sermon on the Mount. But if I get into that, something like that, it's, you know, it's not going to be a one sermon thing, you know. There's a lot in here to unpack if you get into this. It's beautiful, it's wonderful as we look at that. But today our focus is going to be on that one verse, Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, the promises that have been associated with the previous Beatitudes Talk about belonging to the kingdom of heaven, inheriting the earth, being comforted, being filled, receiving mercy. But this one is one of the greatest because it offers us this promise. You shall see God. As with all the others, this beatitude fits sequentially. sequentially. There's a reason why Jesus gave these. In a particular, there's an order to them. But here as we come here, we understand and we can see that those who've come to see their sinful state for what it is, they are poor in spirit. They have mourned over their sins and been brought to the humility of recognizing their own inability to do anything about it. That is, their sin, their life. So though they hunger and they thirst for righteousness, and that is the righteousness of God, and they are consequently filled and they receive the beautiful mercy of God, which means that when we come to this particular beatitude, Jesus is talking about people who have come to know God, who are seeking after God, who are saved. That term that we use. We also use the terms that their sins are washed away and they've been made pure. Now today I will be using a lot of churchy uh, phrases. You know, washed in the blood, you know, something like that. Or even uh, to say that our sins are washed away. We sing about that. We do, but that's kind of, that's church. You don't hear that out there. You hear it in a company of believers. But there's a reality to the truth of those phrases for us. And the reality and the truth of those phrases for others. So today, what I want us to look at and want us to consider is what the heart is. What exactly is this heart to which Jesus refers you and I know it isn't the muscle which pumps blood through our bodies. It is something else. We need to ask ourselves, what is this purity about which Jesus speaks? If the pure in heart enjoys a state of blessing and privilege, was it, what does it mean to be pure? And what does it mean to see God? In the scriptures, is it speaking literally or metaphorically? Is it, what is it saying? And how do we then make that application from what we've read today into our own lives. So that's where we're going. 
Cherry always says, when you give him a speech, she always says, over and over and over again, says, you know, tell them, tell them where they're going, you know, what to, tell them where they're going. Then go there, then wrap it up. <laughs> you know? So, uh, hopefully, she's not here to critique me. That's the thing, sometimes I'll say, well, what did you think about the sermon? And she's, sometimes she's like, Daryl, I'm a speech teacher, so you know sometimes she's had a hard time, folks. Not, not with me, okay. She has a hard time sometimes. She said, "I'll sit there and I will critique like a speech teacher rather than listen for you know the message and, and what it is." And she said, "She said I've had to work at it so that I'm just letting God speak to me through what His messenger is is saying uh, to me while I sit and hear and understand rather than." Well, you should have took a long time on that one. Or, you know, get to the point, or that was a bad illustration. You know, so, again, she's not here to defend herself. I love it when she's away. I can say things about it. All right, all right. <laughs> Let's get going. Let's take a look at the heart. What did Jesus mean when he said the pure in heart? The Greek word for heart is cardia, and we get that, you know, our word, and we use cardiac, and, and that... Uh, Kind of thing, and in every culture, you know, has some internal organ which it considers the emotional, spiritual, or mental center of a person. You know, uh, even to the points where, even in in uh, uh, the Bible, it talks about the intestines, feeling in the intestines, and we go, well, we, well don't you have a gut feeling sometimes? I mean, that, that's kind of where we got that, but that the word that is used in a place. There means intestines when it's talking about something that they feel in, intensely. But here when we talk about the heart, it, it, it is really about emotional, spiritual, mental center of a person. You know, in our culture, we, we think about the heart being the center. Uh, you know, we might say, I love you with all my heart. Or we say, let's get to the heart of the matter. Or often we, we are saying, you know, where is the heart and center of the location, you know, center of what we're in? Could be a building, you know. Where's the heart of this plant? You know, I'm not talking about a, you know, potty plant. I'm talking about maybe even, you know, those that people work in. We, we use that, the center. And it is our way off of talking about the very center of a person's emotions, thoughts, or even their essence. And it's used like that in Scripture. It's used 105 times in 98 verses in the New Testament. And it means the center of who we really are, the epicenter, if you will, of our being. And it is this meaning to which our Lord refers here. In the Old Testament, the word for heart is often interchangeable with the word for mind. That's giving insight into that idea of being the center of our emotions, our thoughts, our purity, and, and our spirit. When Samuel comes to David's family and, and looks at his brothers, because God has said, this is the family from which you will find the next king of Israel. And he sees uh, uh, Eliab, the, the oldest, and what a strong and big fellow he was. And, and Samuel thought, hey, this is the guy, but this is what God says to him. Look not on his countenance or his outward appearance or on the height of his stature because I have refused him. For the Lord sees not as a man sees. For a man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. In 2 Kings, we are told to serve the Lord with our whole heart and are without a divided loyalty. In Deuteronomy 4.29, we are told to seek him with all our heart and all of our being. Jesus referred to the heart frequently in his ministry. He said in Matthew 6, 21, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. In Matthew 12, 34 and 35, he, he tells us that, about the true sin of our beings, who we really are. Uh, now, he is talking to the, to the Pharisees here, but I, I think it can be said of us and our generation as well. And this is what Jesus said. Oh, generation of vipers. How can you speak good things when you are evil? For the mouth speaks from the over overflow or out of the abundance of the heart. A good person out of the good treasure of the heart brings forth good things. And an evil person out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. 
So the heart is the center of our being. And so Jesus is saying that they are blessed, they're those who are blessed, those who enjoy a favorable position with God, who have this most fortunate state really of existence, that these people who are in that particular relationship are pure of heart. We've got a problem. Because the Old Testament and other places tell us that the human heart is wicked. Jeremiah says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And the next verse says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the conscience, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doing things. So the heart is wicked. And yet we know that, in the, that we can have a change of heart. And in fact, a change of heart is necessary for salvation. Here's what Paul says in Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. So not only do we see that the heart is the sin of our being, but they are naturally wicked, and we are born with a proclivity, if you will, uh, that we are born with going towards sin. When I was uh, in high school uh, and college, and even in seminary, <laughs> I worked at Disneyland. I worked in a restaurant there, Carnation on uh, uh, Main Street restaurant that was located there. I was hired in to scoop ice cream. That's what I did. I was lucky because most guys who got hired in, their first job was busting tables. I never bust tables. I started scooping ice cream. For two summers, I scooped ice cream. Then I became a waiter for four more summers. And that was a neat thing. But one of the things that happened when I first got there, people understood that I was a Christian. I told them, I'm, I, I'm a Christian. I'm you know, you have, what do you? You know, you're 18. Well, I was 17 when I started. But you're, 80, you know, you're 18. What are you going to do with you? Know, where are you go? Because you're not working Disney. Oh, you know, you just come in on summers, right? So what are you doing? I said, Well, God's called me into the pastor. I'm, I'm going. I'm going to a Christian college. Blah, blah, blah. So one day we get into a conversation. One of the the girls that worked or one of the waitresses and actually helped train me a little bit. Uh, she was. I guess more of an agnostic than anything else, but she had an IQ above 160. Very smart, smart girl. Another guy who, was a, who worked in the kitchen, he was a Christian. He always brought his Bible to work. When he took his, his break, he'd take his Bible and hop in one of the Jungle Cruise uh, boats because they were parked behind our restaurant. That is those that weren't being used, you know. So we'd go in there, and he'd go in there, and he'd always take his Bible out and read. That's what he did on break. He liked to do that. And so uh, he also worked with a cook who was Jewish. Uh, in name only, he didn't really practice it much, but if you have to, he said, I'm a Jew. So one day, uh, the Jewish guy came to me and he said, we've been talking, and that meant that the, the waitress, the, the, uh, uh, he and the other guy, and we want to know what you think. Is man inherently bad, or is man inherently good? I didn't even have to think about it. I just turned to him and said, man is inherently evil. We're born bad. That's the way we go. And then we were able to get into a little bit of a conversation, but not, not much, because hey, we didn't all get our breaks at the same time. You know, we, we had to you know, say something, uh, sometimes when someone wasn't looking, so to speak, so we could just kind of talk about things that didn't pertain to work that's who we are. And that's our fallen state. And we really cannot know God in that fallen state. We really can't be blessed by God, by His presence in that fallen state. But He says to us, I can change your heart. If we confess with our mouths and believe in our hearts, it says we can be saved. And what we mean by that is being saved is that you come into a relationship with the Holy God and He wipes away your sin. He pays the debt for your sin. 
And he creates in you a new heart. I love the description in the Old Testament where he says that he takes our hearts of stone and he replaces it with a heart of flesh. He's talking spiritually there. But he says, I put a new heart into them. And that's what can happen and that's what Jesus is talking about here about the heart, the center of our being. So once we understand what heart means, and again, I think we've gone with, let's look at purity. Let's look at purity. The Greek word employed in our text carries with it the idea of cleanliness or, or purity in the sense that we commonly understand it. It means to be genuine, free from things that would uh, uh, adulterate or contaminate something and, and make it uh, impure. And we talk about, or Mike talk about, about the purity of gold. What's the best carrot of gold, you know? 24. 24. Yeah, 24 carat. That's the most pure gold that we can. So, you know, when I go out, I just, hey, make it at least 12, okay? So, I don't buy a lot of gold. Jerry likes silver, so I'm good with that. Anyway, it also means when you talk about purity, tied with it in Scripture is holiness. Holiness. When we think of purity of the heart, we might think of someone whose motives are pure, who possesses no guile or, or malice, someone maybe who's good natured and may even be somewhat naive. In the South, we always say, bless their heart, right? You don't mean that they have a pure heart. We generally mean something else in the South when we use that. I didn't use that a lot growing up. It wasn't said a lot in my home. But when I came here, you know, we use it for all kinds of things, don't we? Don't we? However, the context here, Jesus isn't talking about that. He is talking about uh, a heart of someone whose sins have been forgiven and whose heart has been made new, as I described it, whose purity comes not from themselves, but from the presence of God within them. Now, when you think of purity, you think about it yourself, what, something that may come to, to mind, a picture of something. Well, I might use, I'm going to use a milk. Milk. A, two, a tall, cool glass of milk. Tasty. Good. But let some foreign object fall into it. Let's say a fly. It becomes readily, readily noticeable that this impurity has contaminated whatever the milk is in. I mean, nobody I know wants to drink milk that has had a fly in it, would you? But if you remove that fly, it looks as if that milk is pure. There are, there are now things in it you cannot see, unseen contaminants that make it impure. See, that is the problem, if you will, with the purity of our own lives, or the goodness of our own lives. We think that we are good, or we look at somebody's life, and however we do in comparison, we might say, well, they have a, a pure life, a, a good life, and they are good people. And I think, again, that's what some of our younger generations are seeing. And they, they look at the people in church and they say, you, you say that you're good. But when we watch you live throughout the, the week and we watch what you do in the name of Christianity, which is interesting in and of itself, we don't see people who are good or who are pure. Folks, this has been going on for a long time. And Jesus said to the, to the Pharisees, you know, your hearts have been contaminated by sin that no one else can see. You, you look on the outside like you are beautiful and wonderful. He said it this way, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. So you too outwardly appear righteous to men, 
but inwardly you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. And folks, a lot of us live like Pharisees. I'm just going to be honest. The standards for citizenship in the kingdom of God are extremely high. External, outward human righteousness might lead people to think that you're pure, but that doesn't cut it with God because he doesn't look on the outside. Remember, what does he look at? The heart. The heart. He looks inside of you. But he says to us, I can transform that heart into something that is pure and something that is good and something that is holy. There's a stain on our heart because of sin. And he says to us, on this side of the cross, the blood of Jesus Christ can wash away the stain of that sin in your heart. What can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Isaiah 1.18 says, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. You see, within the course of his sermon, Jesus is saying that the pure in heart are those who are saved, those who have been washed in the fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, as the song says, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Now I want to differentiate here between what we call positional and conditional purity. Positional and conditional purity. Positional purity is what happens when I am saved. When I am saved, God declares that I am a saint, holy, pure. And when he looks at me, positionally I am holy because I have been given the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He bore our sins. He bore my sins on the cross. And my sins were placed on him. He didn't sin. He didn't become sinful. But my sins were placed on him uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21, I think it is. And then it says that our righteousness, or his righteousness has been imparted to us. And so positionally, when we stand before God as we are saved, he sees us as pure and clean. Because he looks at us to the righteousness of Christ, to what Christ has done. And because of that, he's written my name and your name if you're saved in the Lamb's Book of Life. And he's declared to you that I am his. He's declared to you that you are His. One of the things that, that I try to do when I pray for those I know who told me they belong to Jesus, when I get by their bedside and, and you know, they, I don't know if they hear me or not, some of them, but hearing is one of the last things to go. And so I, I get damn close to their ear often and I will say, God, this is your son. Or this is your daughter. You know him. You know her. And that's because positionally they are a son and daughter through Jesus Christ. And conditionally, or positionally, they're pure. Now, conditionally, and conditional purity is another matter. Because the truth is that the condition of a Christian's walk can be so bad, it can be out of step with God, that there are impurities in their lives. Now let's go back to that glass of milk. It had a fly in it. What if you didn't know the fly was in it until you drank it all and found it at the bottom? I know, nasty, huh? Hey. And yet that's what sin does in our lives even if we belong to Jesus. We are not pure, we're impure because we, we sin. How many of you can say that at least one day this week that you lived a holy, pure life for 24 hours? Thank you for being honest. I, I had to put my hand down, I just did that to see if you would do it, okay? We don't. We don't. We don't walk in a, 
in a manner that is worthy of the Lord, as Paul wrote in Colossians 1.10. He says, do that, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please Him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So to be pure in heart speaks to my position as a Christian before God, but it also speaks to my condition in the walk with my God. He calls us to walk holy lives. He really does. And the more that we get to know Him, and the more that we read His Word, and the more that we let the Holy Spirit control how we live, what we do, what we think, what we post, what we see on TV, what pictures we take, all of the things that involve our lives, when we are more and more and more conscious of the God who is in us, then the questions that keep coming at you should be, will that honor God if I say it? Will that honor God if I see it? Will that honor God if I post it or repost it? Will that honor God if I do it? Those are questions we need to ask ourselves daily. And I will say this for the child of God, if you don't, don't get hung up in guilt. For the Holy Spirit, His purpose is here is to guide you into truth, but also His purpose is to convict the world of sin. And His purpose is to let the child of God know when they're going the wrong way. They're going to say the wrong thing. We're going to do the wrong thing or think the wrong thing. And when we understand and we see, we can say to God, I am sorry, I confess that sin to you. Give me the strength not to do that again. Confess our sins, his faithful <coughs> just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So to be pure in heart, again, talks about my position as a Christian and my condition. And what will happen if we are pure in heart? We shall see God. That's the promise here in this beatitude. And it's given to those who made Jesus Christ Lord of their lives, those who experienced His cleansing, those who have His presence in, in them, they shall see God. Now there's a future application to this in, in the sense that someday all who are saved will go to heaven and there, and there God will be will be revealed more of himself than what we see of him here. And we will see him a whole lot more plainly when we go to heaven. But Jesus isn't saying, you know what, if you're pure in heart, someday, someday, you shall see God. I think he also is talking about what takes place here on earth. Of course, there are some who would say, you can see God all around you. All you have to do is look. Yes, we do see God in creation. In fact, Romans 1 tells us that even the lost can recognize God through his general revelation of himself in, in creation in, in the world. But Jesus is saying much more than, well, you can see God in his handiwork as creation. I want you to understand that Jesus, of course, is speaking to a Hebrew audience. And while the Greek people, in their culture is more, when they talked about they shall see, they, they, they used and looked at what they saw. For the Hebrew, they were more people of the ear. That is what they heard. It says in Deuteronomy, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. It says in Revelation, he said it more than once, Jesus, to the churches, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says. But he says to a Hebrew audience, it is one who hears, he said, you shall see. You shall see. But they knew that it had been said in their scriptures, that God says to Moses, you cannot see my faith, for no one can see me and live. And John 1.18 tells us that no man has seen God at any time the only begotten of God, that is Jesus, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him, or he has shown him. So when he says that the pure in heart shall see God, what is Jesus saying? Well, he is using that idea 
not so much physical sight, but that we shall see mentally and have spiritual discernment, we will have perception, and we use that even today in similar ways when you, we use the word to see. Don't we say to someone, can't you see what I mean? And we're not talking about, look, here, here, can't you? No, we're, we're talking often about ideas or perceptions. When we want somebody to change their will, don't we? Can't you see it my way? We're not talking about looking at it with their eyes. Or we might even say we want you to see it clearly. So we, we use that word in that way. We might even be say, you know what? Just wait and see what's going to happen. Just wait and see. So it's really talking about it, you know, you'll understand or you'll get it. And, this context, physical sight is not necessary. You know, for even a blind man can have insight, can he or she, can't they? The blind can have insight. They can perceive. So Jesus isn't necessarily talking about physical sight, but about perception and understanding and discernment. And in fact, throughout Scripture, the metaphor of blindness is often used for spiritual life. Cheryl didn't know I was going to use this illustration. I didn't know she was going to sing that song. In fact, I made a note for me while I was over in the office earlier on my thing. I said, Amazing Grace, John knew. When I came to this part of that we use blindness as a metaphor for those who are lost. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Thanks, Cheryl, for reminding me well, about that. Awesome. What? Yeah, but he sang the words. And he put it in my head too. See, the blessing here is this. A person who is pure in heart allows their life to be lost in Jesus and allows Jesus to live through them. And through that, he lives through their understanding and he lives through their perception and he, he lives in such a way that, that God shows us and helps us to see his ways, his will, his heart, his hand and the things that happen around us. Paul says in, in Ephesians that those who do not know God, they are blinded in their hearts. But those whom God comes to, He helps them to see. And the Spirit comes into them. And in doing that, seeing God, we see His will unfold in our lives. We see his hand of provision every day. Every day you can see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now let me ask you this. In a 24-hour period, sometime this week, did you see God at work in your life, anybody? Did you see him at work? There's some things you haven't seen if you just look around. But it was God at work in your life. I need electricity. Well, maybe it was God at work to get the right people in the right place at the right time so Nancy could have electricity again. You know? Or maybe God put things together so that you met somebody you haven't thought of in a long time and there they are. Or you thought, of, there they are, you get to talk to them. You think that wasn't God putting you two together? See him. Or maybe you've been calling the wrong number and the guy happens to be an electrician and you happen to need an electrician. Is that God putting something together? Something that you can see? Most of you are shaking your head yes, so thank you for agreeing with that because I will tell you, that is God. That is where we see Him and if we'll open our eyes, there are things that we can see that all we can say is that was God. Thank you, Sheriff. There's no other explanation. And he's saying to us, blessed, happy are, in the condition, those who are pure in heart, those who are saved. Why? Because they shall see God. Invariably and invariably, you will see God if you have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you. Those, though, who are lost in sin, they cannot recognize God. They cannot perceive God at work. He's always revealing himself to us. He's ever about the business of guiding us and directing us. And the problem is not with his revelation. The problem is not with his direction. The problem is not with his guidance. The problem lies with our inability 
to discern or sense that revelation, direction, and guidance in our lives. It's our problem. But the closer you are to Him, the more sensitive you will be in discernment in what you see going on. Is that a God or not of God? So purity enables us and enhances our spiritual insight. It helps us to see the flies, folks, in the milk. To conclude, though, I want to ask you a couple of questions, what you might call diagnostic questions, because what they are is, well, I want you to look inside. I want you to ask yourself, have you ever had your heart cleansed by God? In the context of this passage, you can say that, have I come to that point in my life where I have been humbled by my sin, mourned over it to the point that I've recognized my inability to do anything about it. And because of that, I, I understand that someone else has to do something about the sin in my life. Because I really want to. I hunger for righteousness and I hunger for doing the things that are good and that are right. And if you do, you can come to God and have your sins washed away, like I said before. If that is not you, that is you've never had your heart cleansed by God. If your life has not changed, because folks, this is the thing about Christianity. This is the thing about it. It is not a religion. It is a relationship. It's not about doing. It is about being. And what I mean by that is it is about Jesus Christ in your life changing you from what you have been and how you've lived so that you will be different and live differently. So your identity, folks, your identity is that you are in Christ. The problem we have in our culture today is that we're all trying to find our identity. And we're all trying to find our identity in other things other than Jesus Christ. And the devil wants to, us to be confused about who we are. And so he says, who are you? And we begin to list things. Well, I am a male. I have to have white skin. I am from this particular background. I grew up in this particular place with all its culture. I happen to be a preacher. I happen to be a chaplain. I happen to like to teach. So here's my identity, right folks? I wrapped all those up. And the devil wants to say, are you sure you're a male? Maybe you identify as something else. Are you sure that God really has called you into that particular profession because you're lousy at it? And he has called you to be a husband, but you're not doing what you're supposed to do. So I don't think that's a very good thing to put out there. But here, folks, shifts. If my identity starts as this, I am in Christ, that means I have a relationship with the Father through Jesus the Son. That I am pure in heart because I am righteous because of Jesus. Then it changes the way I look at myself. And I have a confidence in this. I belong to Him. And if I belong to Him, Folks, in some ways, I don't care what you have to say about me. Because yeah, I'm not perfect. And you can tell me you didn't do it right here. Okay. I still might think I did, but okay. Or you might say something else. Or you might look at me, you know, derogatorily, negatively. I care about that. But I don't care about that. <clears throat> Why? Because I am a child of God. I am a co-heir with Jesus Christ. 
As C.S. Lewis put it, what's a king and queen in Narnia? Always a king and queen in Narnia. Therefore, I am a king because I am a son of God. Not because of anything that I have done, but because of what Jesus Christ has done for me in living a perfect life and dying as a perfect sacrifice to pay the penalty for sins. And if you haven't had your heart cleansed, if you have not come to Jesus in a relationship, if your life hasn't changed, then you need to ask yourself, really, is God a part of my life? Do I have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Did you know there's nowhere in Scripture that says invite Jesus into your heart? It doesn't say it. And sometimes I think we make it so easy. Well, just invite Jesus into your heart. You'll be good. You'll get out of hell and you'll have a one-way ticket to heaven. And a lot of people said, oh, amen, I'll pray that prayer. Now, hey, I'm going to heaven. But their lives don't change. They are not indwelt by the Spirit of God. Daryl, how can you say that? Well, I've seen them. I've seen people who say they're a Christian and don't act like it. Who say they're a Christian and have, have no change in their life. Who say they're a Christian in name only, but they never get together with God's people. They don't come to church. They don't read the scriptures. They don't take the time to get to know God. God already knows them. And yet, I'm judging but I am also judged by the same way that I judge. Because here's the thing, folks. If they don't know Jesus Christ, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are not going to heaven. Even you, if all your life you've done good things, if all your life you have, you have even gone to a church, I speak to a lady, and a lot of times what she says is, I've done good. I believe in God. The first part the demons don't do, the second part they do, that is, they believe in God. So a person who believes in God, they have a demon faith. Way to go. I say this because I want you to see the reality and I hope in your own life you're able to pass that reality to someone you care about, someone that you love, that does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And you want them to be with you in heaven, don't you? Don't you want your loved one to be with you in heaven when this all comes crashing down? Or when God comes back, Jesus comes back to pick his, up his church? Don't you want your loved ones that you know that do not know Jesus? Don't you want them to be in heaven with you? Then why don't you tell them? Why aren't you concerned enough about them? At least to pray for their souls. Sorry, I got to preach it here for a minute. God can change your heart and make it pure. But, second question. Are you walking in purity before the Lord? So for the Christian, how are you doing? Are you walking in a manner that is worthy of the calling, that is worthy of Jesus Christ? Are you walking like Christ? And as I said, you all admitted, not always. I don't either. But you can be better at walking with Jesus. You can walk in a manner that is worthy. You have to be obedient to God's word. And if you're obedient to God's word, then God will help you live a more pure life. A more holy life. And not so you can go around to somebody and say, I'm holier than you. I've seen you. I know me. I'm a lot better than you. That's not what it's about. Sorry to be a pick on you. Pointing my <laughs> finger at you. 
Remember, one and two, three fingers pointing back. My thumb's not a finger, it's a thumb. So, okay? Is there something in your life that is keeping you from walking in purity with God? Psalmist said in Psalm 139, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. If there's something in your life that's keeping you from a, a deeper, and more intimate relationship with Jesus, you need to confess it. You need to ask him to help you take care of it. And even as we speak this morning, and as the Spirit of God moves in your heart, what is He saying to you today, Christian? And what will you do about it? And if you don't know Him? Last Sunday, I got a text from my twin brother to tell me about a friend of mine. I say friend. He's only my friend because we happen to spend some time in school together. I didn't hang out with him after school except when we played flag football in seventh and eighth grade. He was on the offensive line in front of me. And I was one of the, uh, the tailbacks. And then as we went on, you know, even in high school, I didn't have much to do. I mean, just didn't, ha didn't hang with him. But he's my friend because, you know, I grew up with him in school. He's had uh, leukemia. He's even had a bone marrow transplant that didn't work. So last week I called in and I said, how are you doing? He said, I don't have much time. I'm going to take the Lord's hand soon. One of the neat things for me is to know that he's a Christian and not from anything that I ever did. But I know that he's a Christian because he told me that. He even likes me, you know, on my Harmony Baptist thing that gets posted. Dan likes me. <laughs> he told me he, he tried to listen, but he said, I turned it on and he said the sound was so bad I couldn't understand the thing you were saying. I said that in a southern accent, huh? He said, yeah. <laughs> I don't know why, but as I was driving here this morning, God just placed him on my heart. I don't know any more about him than I did when I talked to him. That is, you know, what's going on with you? But this I know, and this it breaks his heart. His wife is an atheist. She doesn't believe in God. He said, she. She wants to see facts. She wants, you know, she's scientific. He said, I, I wish it wasn't so, but that's what it is. And I did pray. I said, Dan, maybe in dying a good death, you will show her what kind of God you serve. Folks, we aren't guaranteed tomorrow. We aren't guaranteed beyond the moment that we have right now. Today is the day of salvation, says the scripture. Now is the time. If you don't know him, let's get that settled. If you know him, you're not living right. Let's get that settled. Out with me in prayer as uh, Ray and Jane come to lead us in our invitation here. Father, it is you who changes us and changes our heart. And only because of you can we be pure in heart. And only if we are pure in heart, saved by the grace of God through faith, acknowledging who you are. And acknowledging what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross, then, then, we can come to you. And so we give our hearts and lives to you. 
in Jesus' name.